everyone. Thank you very much for coming along to this online version of Amory uh, seminar series. My name is Letitia Gunton and I'm the current Chadwick Biodiversity Fellow at the Australian Museum. The Chadwick Biodiversity Fellowship is actually a two year fellowship for early career researchers to study um, specimens um, in the Australian Museum. Uh, which is a really great opportunity. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you um, about a cruise that I went on in 2018 with other members of um, the Australian Museum staff and about um, what we're doing with those specimens after we've collected them on that research cruise. The title of my talk is Discovering the Biological Diversity of Tasmania's Underwater Mountains and the Associated Worms. My talk is divided into two parts. The first part is about Seamount Coral Survey, which happened in 2018. Um, for those of you that might remember last year, Ingo and I actually gave a talk on this um, survey. And here I wanted to show you uh, two, some videos that have come um, from this survey that journalists made on board. So in part one, I'm going to talk to you about the survey to the Tasmanian Seamounts and show you two approximately four minute videos um, from that survey. The second part of my talk is about an illustrated checklist that we're compiling of all the deep sea worms, so the annelids, around Australia. So part one, um, the Tasmanian Seamount Cruise was led by CSIRO Park and Parks Australia, and it was on board the Marine National Facilities RV Investigator. It took a month to sample the cold water corals um, and their associated marine life around the Tasmanian seamounts. And this was in the marine parks, the Huon and Tasman fracture zone. And this was in November to December in 2018. There were 40 scientists on board, technicians, marine park managers and communication specialists. And this was supported by the ship's crew and some journalists. And the journalists put together a blog and short films about the research going on board, on going on board. And it's actually these short films that I'd like to share with you today. And the four participants from the Australian Museum were myself, Francesco in the first leg, and Ingo and Alison in the second leg. Um, so some background on the RV investigator. It's um, operated um, uh, by the Marine National Facility and um, CSIRO. It's 94 metres long. It was launched in 2014 and it can hold up to 40 researchers and technicians and 20 crew. It's quite expensive to run. Um, so every day it costs at sea, it costs on average um, $140,000 uh, per day at sea. Um, so this is quite obviously quite expensive. So the samples and the data that we get from these cruises um, are all really val valuable. The first video I'd like to show you today um, is um, given by the journalists, um, put together by the journalists, and it's talking about the re remotely operated camera facilities um, that we had on board. We are on the way to the Huon and Tasman Fracture Marine Parks, south of Tasmania. We're here to study deep sea coral communities living on an unusually large group of underwater mountains known as seamounts. Laying eyes on the hidden world of deep sea corals is a challenging endeavour. The high-tech camera kit we're using on this seamount survey is the eighth version designed and built by CSIRO over the last 20 years. For survey chief scientist Alan Williams from CSIRO, these cameras are his eyes on the sea floor. This will be the third visit to this area. It was surveyed first in the late 90s and again a decade later in 2006. The surveys themselves are quite complicated. Each camera transect runs down a seamount from its peak to its base. We need careful navigation and 
and we need very careful piloting of the camera platform as it moves through the water. The vessel is towing the camera down the continental margin adjacent to the seamounts area. This map here, the underlay shows the seabed topography. The two um, symbols you can see here, the first one is the ship and the second one behind it is the tow camera with a beacon on it that transmits the position of the camera back to the ship. Imagine having the job of flying the deep tow camera at the end of thousands of metres of cable, just two metres above the seafloor. This is the latest generation of the CSIRO Ocean and Atmospheres towed camera platform. Carl Forsey and Jeff Cordell of CSIRO are two of the pilots on this survey. They absolutely love their work, including its many challenges. With the latest cameras, we're able to control them via ethernet from the surface. We're able to mount them in specially CNC machined housings to take 3D stereo imagery of the seafloor. And of course, cameras are a lot higher resolution these days. There's much better light sensitivity. So we're able to take advantage of all those features in our cameras and get the absolute best quality photos up on the surface in real time. When we're looking at new discoveries, species that have never been seen before by anyone, and you're controlling that with a joystick, it's a really good feeling. 10 years ago, a remote controlled deep diving vehicle from the United States placed nine granite settlement plates at the base of Sister Seamount in the Huon Marine Park. The settlement plates provide precise locations for scientists to monitor new coral growth, but finding them again in 1,000 metres of water requires the utmost teamwork, dexterity and patience. A drop camera deployed beneath the ship relays the view of the remote sea floor back to Alan and the camera pilot in the operations room. While the pilot can move the camera up and down, the only way to search side to side is to move the entire ship. Guided by the camera and a map of the sea floor, Alan communicates with the skipper on the bridge, who makes tiny adjustments using the ship's dynamic positioning system. James, could you take us four metres east, please? <laughs> Yep. Thank you. After many hours of manoeuvring, the settlement plates are spotted and the camera is coaxed close enough to take a clear image. Well, we found them. This time, the settlement plates show no sign of new coral growth confirming the suspicion that these deep sea reefs will take a very long time to recover from damage. That's a good enough look to uh, I think conclude there's nothing on it. Seeing the images coming up from the seafloor 1,000 metres below us is quite extraordinary. All of the information and data that's acquired through these voyages, it's made freely available to researchers all over the country and all over the world to help make decisions about future management of these places and places like them around the world. These deep sea cameras show us how deep sea coral communities change predictably with depth and the kind of substrate available for them to attach to. The camera allows us to view the animals remotely, but for a better understanding, we need to take a closer look. Cool, so that video was showing um, how we collect images um, via tow cameras. And the next part is um, actually bringing those uh, specimens up from the deep. So this is what um, staff at the Australian Museum were involved in, um, which was um, taking part in once the trawls had been um, taken from the deep sea floor, processing the fauna um, from those trawls. Um, so here you can see a trawl net that's come up with lots of different um, corals, soft corals, um, some fish, um, some starfish. Um, so now we're going to the second video is on how we actually went about processing those trawls. We are on the way to the Huon and Tasman Fracture Marine Parks, south of Tasmania. We're here to study deep sea coral communities living on an unusually large group of underwater mountains known as seamounts. Here on Investigator, biological samples are collected so we can better understand the animals that call this reef home. 
Many of the animals that live in the deeper areas of marine parks are unknown to scientists or can't be identified from underwater video footage. To better understand what species live where, physical samples are collected using the beam troll, a small sampling net that is towed along the sea floor. When the troll comes in, it's action station. The biologists wait eagerly for this moment, excited by the prospect of something no one has ever seen before. This is Investigator's wet lab, where biologists sort, label and preserve animals collected from the Hewan and Tasman Practor Marine Parks. Candace Untide from CSIRO is in charge of the 2pm to 2am shift on board the vessel. She runs the lab when a beam troll is conducted in these hours. So you've seen us bring up a beam troll, it's this really mixed bag of animals of all different kinds. And then we spend quite a long time sorting them into things that look alike and we identify them as far as possible. We separate them out, we preserve them, and we give them a unique number so we can trace that data back. And then specialists take those animals and identify them even further. Many of the specimens we collect on the voyage will end up here. This beautiful coral in front of me was collected from a seamount in the Hewan Marine Park. It's now held in the TMAG collection to be used for further research. These animals live in cold, dark environments, clinging to the rocky sides of seamounts far beneath the ship. Coral communities are the heroes of this mysterious world because they provide caves, tunnels and scaffolding for other animals to hide in and live on. Kiralee Moore of the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery has spent a lot of time getting to know them. The octocorals are part of the larger diverse ecosystem that we know exists in these cold water habitats. And some of them are quite, stand quite tall, some of them grow over things, some of them are soft, some hard. Um, so it provides a huge variety of different substrates, different textures, different abilities for things to grow with and in or on. To see the specimens while they're fresh is a completely different experience to when they have been preserved. Alexandra Weaver is well acquainted with a common resident of these deep sea reefs, the brittle star. There are more than 2,000 species of brittle star. Brittle stars are characterized by uh, a round disc, so that's the, the center of the body, and it has also five, uh, usually five arms. And uh, here in the middle, you can see that uh, there's the mouth, so that's where they feed. This one is uh, quite interesting because it is always found in association with a deep sea coral. Uh, so you can find it here. That's uh, how we found it uh, from the beam troll. So it was really closely. Uh, It uh, extends its arm in the water column and it uh, feeds on the particles that uh, are in the water. And it can also feed on the particles that are deposited on the corals. And uh, like that, it also helps uh, the coral to be clean of uh, particles. Karen Gallard Holmes from CSIRO joined her first research voyage more than 40 years ago, giving her a unique and invaluable perspective. Because this is an ongoing series of expeditions that date back to 1997. So we are still using photographs that date back to that date. So what we're looking for is things we haven't seen before or that are better than what we've seen before to try and record the colours. We're still learning a lot about these and in the sort of sampling methods that we use, we are not in the situation of being able to pluck individual things up or spot them in situ. So uh, this is the best way that we can to actually record it. Identifying individual animals is an exciting and complex process. Sedentary or slow moving animals are easily collected and sampled, but for faster movements such as eels or fish, we need a different strategy. So during those beam troll samples, some of the abundant animals that we saw um, were corals, soft water corals. Um, we also found associated with these corals, um, we found um, squat lobsters and polychaete worms. And here are some more um, examples of deep sea critters that we found in the beam trolls. There are some uh, annelid worms, some, uh, some worms to the right hand side of this image. And on the left hand side, we have some sea snails at the top, some gastropods, and at the bottom um, left, some solitary corals. 
The second part of this talk, I would like to talk about what we're doing with these deep sea specimens once they're brought back to the museum. Uh, previous, there have been quite a few, there have been a few recent um, surveys to deep sea areas around Australia. Uh, there was the um, RV investigator that went to the eastern Australian uh, margin, which was started in Tasmania and went down to up to southern Queensland. And there have also been some uh, sampling voyages in the Great Australian Bight, which is um, South Australia. Um, so I'm, what I'm interested in is the annelid worms, and these are marine segmented worms, and um, it's a large group, including now uh, Siblogynids, Echiurans, and also traditionally um, the traditionally accepted ones um, like the um, Archaeanelida and the Polychaeta. Um, so annelid worms are marine segmented worms, and they're generally the dominant taxa, taxon in deep sea sediments. They're quite diverse and often quite abundant. And they're really important for burying and processing organic matter and recycling the nutrients and also for bioturbation. So these annelids um, dig down into the sediment and introduce oxygen into areas that wouldn't have oxygen otherwise in the lower areas, lower parts of the sediment. At the moment on the Atlas of Living Australia, there's around 158,000 records of annelids from Australia, um, but only a thousand of these are from below a thousand metres water depth. So um, obviously not very many annelids have been collected from the deep seas and this part of uh, the project There have been some previous studies um, on um, the Eastern Australian Briss and um, the Great Australian Bight. So um, here's a figure that I took on the right. I took from O'Hara et al 2020 and it shows the sampling voyages um, from Eastern Australia which um, start off the coast of Tasmania and they are, were all taken up to um, southern Queensland and then um, you can also see the sampling stations um, in the Great Australian Bight. And when O'Hara et al looked at the large benthic megafauna, so megafauna are large animals that can be caught in trawls and seen in uh, video images. Um, so examples of these would be sponges, barnacles, um, decapods, ophioids. They found 666 operational taxonomic units. 51 of these uh, species. Um, and they estimated that around 60% of the fauna from Eastern Australia and the Greater Great Australian Bight was undescribed. And they found a particularly high species richness um, in from uh, southeastern Australia. On a study um, on decapods um, from Eastern Australia and the Greater Australian Bight, um, there were 191 species and 19% of these were thought to be undescribed. And um, there were the upper bathial depths um, increased in diversity with decreasing latitude. So that's um, what we know. And I sort of wanted to see what um, were the patterns of uh, annelids and what sort of annelids, um, how many species of annelids we'd be finding in these deeper areas. The um, specimens were brought back from these cruises and most of them were registered at the Australian Museum. Uh, they were then sorted into families at the Australian Museum and then we identified to species level the families that we could. Um, some groups um, we couldn't identify at the Australian Museum, so we sent these to taxonomic specialists around the world. And in total, um, the project that I'm working on has around 30 co-authors from 18 different institutions around the world. Uh, these are in the UK, Germany, Italy, Poland, Norway, USA, China um, and Japan. And so we really try to look for taxonomic specialists that could help us identify these particular groups of annelids. In, in all, um, we've got around just um, 5,700 specimens and at the moment um, there's 261 species of annelid worms and around half of these are new to science. Um, from preliminary results, I've um, found that actually the highest species, species, species richness or number of species is highest in the Bass Strait um, and lowest around Fraser Island. 
Um, obviously, we've got quite a few undescribed species, so I just wanted to um, highlight a few that I thought were um, particularly interesting and some that have already been described. So on the top left is um, a species of pectinarid, and pectinarids are called ice cream cone worms um, commonly um, because they have a tube that looks a bit like an ice cream cone. And um, some researchers here at the Australian Museum, Pat Hutchins and Lena Kuprianova, um, together with a Chinese student, um, have described the species um, Peta investigatoris, um, named after the RV investigator. Uh, the next species along is a species of uh, Melanopsis, and this is a species of Amphretid. So Amphretids generally live in tubes and they form tubes um, out of sediment particles. And generally all you would see are the branchi um, that they use to breathe, poking out the top, and their buccal tentacles that they use to feed, poking out the top of the tube. Um, so far, um, I've just, I'm describing uh, currently uh, two species of these worms. Uh, the next one along is um, called Phallocostroma timoharii. This was another one um, described by Pat and Lena and Jing um, at the museum and in conjunction with a uh, university in China. And this one's quite nice because they've named it after Tim O'Hara, who was the chief scientist on the Eastern, um, deep sea Eastern uh, voyage. And the next on the top right are Dorvaleids, and you can see the darker parts are their jaws, and these are generally found around um, organically enriched environments. Um, we think we've got around six new species of Dorvaleid. Uh, the next one, uh, number uh, lettered C, is um, a species of Serpulid. Serpulids are interesting worms. They form calcareous tubes and they attach these tubes to um, bits of dead coral or live coral, um, also stones. And this is a species that Lena is describing at the moment, Bathy mammalia. Uh, the bottom left-hand corner, we have a stenapsid. And stenapsids are commonly called mud owls because they have this quite colorful ventral caudal shield that's um, actually made out of um, bits of deposited um, iron and um, they look a bit like owls, I guess. So that's sort of like the owl's eyes, the um, ventral cord or shield, um, and their body looks a bit like an owl um, when it's resting. <laughs> um, so there's new species of stenapsid. Um, the next one along A is a polynoid. Um, so these are scale worms, and you can see two of the scales that have dropped off from this worm below the actual worm. And these are species of uh, scale worms. So unfortunately, this one has lost all its scales, but two of its scales are beneath it. And the scales are really important for identifying species. And the last one on the bottom right, F, is a species of um, a new fit. And anufids are worms that form tubes out of bits of shell and uh, formanifera and sediment grains. They, this one has put the larger pieces of shell on the um, ventral and dorsal side, and then it has smaller parts, um, smaller shells on the lateral side, and they're actually quite selective in uh, selecting parts for their tube. The conclusions and future directions. So. Um, Using this large project, um, we're going to put together um, a list of all the deep sea annelids um, recorded um, around the eastern abyss and compare these with um, GAB, and, uh, Great Australian Bite annelids. Um, this um, manuscript will have, this project will have um, short descriptions along with digital images of the specimens and short descriptions. And this is really important because um, we don't have that much um, small invertebrate, invertebrate data um, for Australian marine parks, as many of these samples were taken from Australian marine parks. And baseline data is really important for understanding these environments, understanding the effect of anthropogenic impact, protection and restoring these um, communities. The Great Australian Bight is um, prospect, uh, perhaps uh, one of the world's most prospective underexplored areas for oil and gas um, and future oil and gas um, uh, exploration is proposed in that area. So it's very important to understand what communities live there before um, we start disturbing them. 
The Australian Museum has a really fantastic collection of deep sea material, which is actually fixed in ethanol, um, making it suitable for molecular work, which is very useful. And uh, the next part of my fellowship, I'm going to concentrate on genetic connectivity of these amphretids, um, one of the families of annelid worms across eastern Australia and the Great Australian Bight. I want to finish off by saying thank you very much to everyone that collected samples on the um, RV investigator that are now deposited in the museum that I'm using um, to study. And also all the collaborators, all the 30 collaborators in the Australian Museum and around the world. Uh, the Marine Invertebrate Collection um, Management Team, um, who are really obviously essential in sending all these specimens to um, different uh, places around the world. And also volunteers, Tony, Wendy and Greg for helping me sort through some specimens. And Susan, who's been really great at helping with Photoshop. I also want to thank Megan Warwick for putting together this online um, online uh, seminar series. Uh, it's been quite interesting learning all the different teams functionalities. And finally, if you're interested and want to learn more about the cruises, I highly recommend that you go to um, the blog website at the bottom here. And if you want to look at any more of the videos that were put together by journalists on the cruise, um, you can access them on the YouTube site. Thanks very much.